Okay, and we're back. So we're going to have a special session. Uh, this is why it's called special lecture. Uh, we will invite Professor Alexia. Uh, he's going to discuss about phenylephrine, in, especially in the obstetric anesthesia. And I would like to thank President Yuskabi for sponsoring uh, this special session. And for this session, I would like to invite Dr. Susilo uh, as moderator. Thank you, Krisha. Uh... Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Selamat siang, salam sejahtera, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, kita bersyukur hari ini kita mengadakan special lecture. Karena apa? Karena phenylephrine akan segera hadir di Indonesia. Obat yang sudah sangat lama kita tunggu, nggak ada yang memproduksi. Jadi, terima kasih buat PT Fresenius KB Indonesia yang me beranikan diri untuk menyiapkan obat ini. Saya pikir obat ini penting untuk masa depan regional anestesi dan obstetric anesthesia selain di critical care. Uh, untuk itu saya ingin memperkenalkan Prof. Alexia. He is a senior consultant in the Department of Women Anesthesia in KK Women Hospital and Children Hospital. Personally, I've known Alex since 2004. He has many distinguished achievements. Currently, he is the CEO of KK Women and Children Hospital with many distinguished achievements. Lately, he just launched the KKI Children Blood and Cancer Center. Prof. Alex has studied phenylephrine for more than a decade. He has numerous publications on this matter, especially in obstetric anesthesia. So it is a great honor for me to invite you, Prof. Alex, to speak about phenylephrine in obstetric anesthesia. The time is your, Alex. Thank you so much, Cecilio. Good afternoon. I really enjoyed the, the session just now. It was a bit sad that we had to end <laughs> and I have to start this lecture. Really, I think, uh, thank you so much for the very kind introduction and, and really want to wish um, everyone uh, a lovely afternoon and, and thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Again, I would like to thank Cecilio and team uh, for this invitation and, and heartily congratulate uh, uh, Pak Susilo and, and you know the Rakan Rakan for really uh, for organizing this meeting so successfully for, for 19 years in a row. You know, I I, uh, I really miss the face-to-face -face, uh, interaction yes. as well as uh, I really look forward to, to meeting everyone, uh, uh, my Indonesian friends in person. Uh, hopefully soon, uh, and 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 uh, of course uh, today I'm I'm privileged to have this opportunity to uh, share with you my experience uh, in the use of uh, phenylephrine in obstetric anesthesia, specifically in the context of uh, treating hypotension during spinal anesthesia for cesarean section. If I may share my slide, uh, yes, please. Um, yeah. I trust you could see uh, yes. my slide now. Thank, thank you yeah. a lot. And um, uh, I do have a, a dis uh, some disclosures. I, I do hold patents and, and own intellectual property in the uh, space of obstetric anesthesia. And uh, some of these have been licensed to uh, commercial outfits. And like what uh, the chairman mentioned earlier, I, I work as a senior consultant in the Department of Women's Anesthesia at KK Women's and Children's Hospital, formerly known as uh, Kandang Kerbau Maternity Hospital. Our hospital is actually more than 160 years old. And um, we, we are the, still the only women's and children's hospital in Singapore. Um, and, and we still do about 12,000 deliveries every year. And our cesarean section rate is uh, in the region of 27%. So when I started training in, in obstetric anesthesia 30 years ago, uh, more than 90% of all cesarean sections in KK Hospital uh, were done uh, by general anesthesia. Today, the situation is, is quite different, right? Um, more than 90% of uh, cesarean sections now in KK uh, conducted 
uh, under regional as anesthesia, and specifically uh, spinal anesthesia. And that's uh, an overwhelming uh, number of uh, uh, patients uh, given spinal anesthesia for elective cesarean section in our hospital. Uh, there are some reasons why this is so. Uh, spinal anesthesia has been shown to uh, to be very safe uh, in comparison to general anesthesia. For example, uh, there is evidence of a reduction in maternal morbidity and mortality. It's, it's reliable, it's, it's fast, and it's relatively uh, easy to administer. However, hypotension uh, remains one of the most uh, important and most common side effects as a result of spinal anesthesia, as a result of um, the so-called pharmacological sympathectomy or sympatholysis uh, because of the action of local anesthesia in, the, uh, um, in this uh, uh, central neuraxial block. So how common is hypotension during spinal anesthesia for cesarean section? Well, the answer depends on how you define hypotension, right? And, and uh, apparently there are some 15 different definitions at least of hypotension in this context, in this paper, which was published several years ago. But the two most frequent definitions found in, the, in this review, indeed, uh, in subsequent ones, are a decrease below 80% of baseline, which is a variable sort of definition, or a blood pressure uh, below 100 millimeters mercury, which is a more fixed definition. And, and based on these definitions, the incidence of uh, hypotension may be as high as 70%. So th that's really quite significant. And there are consequences, right, of hypotension, uh, both on the mother as well as on the fetus. Um, on the mother, uh, we have the uh, increased risk of nausea and vomiting and headaches. And if untreated or improperly treated, uh, this could re result in altered consciousness and occasionally, though thankfully quite rarely, cardiovascular collapse. And there are repercussions as well for the fetus, right? Uh, we all know that the uterine placental perfusion is very pressure dependent. Therefore, hypotension may result um, in fetal hypoxemia and acidosis, having adverse effects on the fetus. Indeed, the umbilical cord pH was found uh, in a previous study to be significantly lower with spinal anesthesia. This is, in, this is in comparison with epidural anesthesia and even with general anesthesia. So there are at least two reasons why this is so. First, the effect of hypotension per se, uh, which uh, would result in a reduced perfusion of the fetus, as well as um, the situation where Ephedrine was previously very widely used to treat hypotension. Ephedrine, uh, we know, crosses the placenta and has a, uh, has a propensity of causing fetal acidosis because of its uh, metabolic effects. And uh, as obstetric anesthetists, one of our main tasks is, of course, to solve our patients' problems, right? And, and, uh, and the aim of the anesthetist should be to treat maternal hypotension quickly and efficaciously, gracefully if possible, or better still, to prevent it. However, despite being the focus of research and controversy for more than three decades, there's no strategy which has been found to eliminate the occurrence of hypotension. And taking a leave from our work in the interactive technology to manage hypotension, there are three parts of this uh, management. Right? So, so those are like the boxes co colored in blue. We need to have a sensor, right? an accurate, reliable monitor. We need to have a controller. In this case, it would be largely uh, a well-informed anesthetist who could make decisions. And we need effective effectors that will be able to either prevent or to reverse uh, the hypotension. In terms of monitors, uh, it cannot be overemphasized, right, that we need accurate measurement of the input data. Um, very infrequently do we see invasive blood pressure monitoring done um, routinely, except for, I guess, exceptional cases. Even though I've seen one center uh, that does that uh, routinely, and this center also almost routinely uses a a laryngeal mask for general anesthesia for cesarean section. But of course, that's a topic for another discussion. Most of us 
uh, by default would use intermittent non-invasive oscillometric blood pressure monitoring, right, with an upper arm device. And we usually cycle this automatically, uh, one to five minute intervals. And uh, this is widely used um, in many, many centers uh, in the world. Uh, recently, uh, there are at least two devices that I'm aware of that uh, uh, employ a continuous non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. The first one is what we call a CNAP, short form for continuous non-invasive blood pressure, arterial pressure monitor, easy to remember. The other one is Nexfin, right, which is um, a product marketed by Edward Life Sciences. So, so these devices are able to provide uh, continuous non-invasive blood pressure monitoring quite uh, reliably. And for most of us who use um, non-continuous, uh, non-invasive blood pressure monitors uh, using the oscillometric method, we would usually cycle uh, these devices to read blood pressures um, something like one to three minutes. And, and indeed, in this study that was published several years ago, the investigators, when they compared um, continuous non-invasive blood pressure monitors with uh, intermittent oscillometric monitoring um, cycle at three minutes interval, they found that up to a third or more than a third of hypotensive episodes could be missed if one uh, program uh, the non uh, the intermittent uh, blood pressure monitors to read at three minutes interval. So the recommendation is to uh, use or, or to more frequently um, uh, detect or measure uh, our patient's blood pressure. In, in our center, we use a one minute interval uh, routinely uh, during spinal anesthesia. There are, there, there's a lot of material written on the use uh, of uh, methods to, to manage hypotension uh, during uh, cesarean section under spinal anesthesia. Uh, largely, there are two, there are three uh, broad categories uh, in, in this respect, um, talking about measures to prevent or to treat hypotension. First relates to positioning, then uh, the use of intravenous fluids as well as vasopressor therapy. I'll go through the first two uh, quite quickly. Um, the use of left uterine displacement is, is actually commonly practiced and, and uh, it's fairly popular, and, but we all know that uh, it does not completely prevent hypotension. Right? Other methods have also been employed, including the full lateral position. This, this is a, uh, a reference to uh, the so-called Oxford technique, whereby um, spinal anesthesia is, is given in the left lateral position and then the patient is then turned to the right uh, lateral position to wait until just before surgery when the patient is turned back into the supine position. So that's been found to, to reduce the incidence of uh, hypotension. Uh, other methods include uh, placing folded sheets or water bags on the hip, uh, or, or sorry, under the hip or, or the flank or tilting the operating table to 15 degrees as well as manual uh, uterine displacement. So in this uh, study that was done several years ago to look at um, the optimal position of mother of the mother during cesarean section, the authors found that uh, many of the studies in this uh, systematic review were of very small sample sizes and, and the quality of the studies uh, was quite uh, variable. Therefore, uh, there's no conclusive evidence for tilting or flexing the table. Um, and uh, this sentiment was actually also reflected uh, by Professor Ruth Landau when she uh, spoke to us uh, in this meeting two weeks ago. Um, however, it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that uh, positioning the woman in the left lateral uh, tilt is completely useless, right? Uh, so, so there have also been studies that found that uh, even though um, uh, lateral tilt uh, did not reduce the incidence of hypotension. It could potentially reduce the use of uh, vasopressor requirements, for example. Next, the use of intravenous fluids. And, and when, I was, uh, when I started training in anesthesia, uh, my consultants would tell me never to give spinal anesthesia without um, crystalloid preloading because uh, that would uh, then prevent hypotension. We now know that that is probably not true. Right? And, and uh, crystalloid co-loading has been found to be uh, more effective, though 
it is we we won't be able to prevent uh, a hypotension just by doing that, right? And, and and there's also some debate about using crystalloids versus colloids. Colloids have been found to be more efficient, i.e., you need less uh, to, to achieve the same effect. But uh, I think the debate or the the um, uh, discussion is ongoing. Uh, but uh, what's clear to us is that uh, fluids alone will not be able to uh, successfully prevent or, or to manage hypotension in the optimal way. So to a large extent, the use of vasopressors is inevitable. Um, and and uh, there are many reasons why hypotension during regional anesthesia is more common in the pregnant population, including increased sensitivity to local anesthetics, including the effect of aortal cable compression that uh, I talked about earlier, as well as the increased susceptibility of uh, pregnant patients to the sympatholytic effect of regional anesthesia. Um, so a, a lot of what I'm gonna be discussing um, in this talk uh, is, I draw reference from this international consensus statement that we published about three years ago. This, this project is of course led by Dr. Michael Kinsella, another familiar uh, face in, um, in this meeting, right? And, and uh, as you can see, there is a variety of vasopressors that uh, you could use depending on the, your place of practice and your availability of these agents. Uh, as for me, I am most familiar uh, with the first two, ephedrine and phenylephrine. I've not uh, got any experience uh, with, with the rest. And um, phenylephrine does possess uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties, which uh, make it very suitable uh, for the treatment of uh, hypotension during spinal anesthesia. Uh, and, and in this guideline, uh, clearly, I... I um, it has been found that, uh, that a vasopressor uh, with predominantly alpha agonist activities is the correct choice to reverse the circulatory effects of spinal anesthesia. And therefore, phenylephrine has the most evidence to support its use. Um, uh, it's not my intent to talk about the, you know, the molecular structure or the detailed uh, pharmacology of phenylephrine, but it suffices to say that uh, phenylephrine is a potent direct alpha-1 adrenergic effect. Most of you probably already know this already. Uh, it has a very fast onset. Uh, however, it does induce uh, what we call baroreceptor mediated bradycardia uh, and could potentially reduce cardiac output in higher doses uh, because uh, it's well known that uh, for a pregnant woman, um, the cardiac output is very rate dependent. So, so some caution must be exercised uh, in that regard. Um, phenylephrine, however, is, is a good agent to, to use because it has a short uh, duration of action and, and uh, it's best given repeatedly as repeated doses or by an infusion. And uh, we talk about the definition of hypotension. What about normal tension? So, so um, how high or how normal do we want the blood pressure to be? Is that uh, uh, during spinal anesthesia, is it 100%, 90% or 80%? This is a question that was exactly asked by uh, Warwick Nganke when he did this study. And uh, to cut the long story short, he found that the incidence of uh, intraoperative nausea and vomiting, as well as a, uh, uh, you know, uh, maintaining the, the umbilical artery pH, that, that's best done by keeping 100% of the baseline uh, blood pressure. So, so what is the baseline blood pressure? So, so in that study, it's recommended that uh, you take the blood pressure of this patient uh, three times and uh, take the mean of it. Uh, and, and all three uh, must be within 10% of uh, one another preoperatively. So, so that's defined as a baseline uh, blood pressure for those who want to use this technique. And um, there are largely two schools with, with regard to the use of phenylephrine. Uh, one talks about uh, uh, prophylaxis or, or preventive uh, measure blocking the onset of hypotension. Uh, the other talks about um, a uh, rescue of uh, uh, blood pressure and or um, ensuring that uh, it doesn't go too, uh, too low. And then uh, you treat that because uh, by definition, hypotension doesn't occur in all the patients, right? So, so, so um, a measure of uh, uh, being a bit 
uh, responsive uh, may be beneficial. So, so there are two schools here, but it seems like the literature is leaning towards uh, prophylaxis, right? And and uh, and how much do we need to use uh, as uh, a prophylactic uh, agent to prevent hypotension? Well, it depends on which papers you read, right? Largely, it's between 25 to 100 mites per minute. And, um, and that's been shown to reduce incidence of hypotension, nausea, and vomiting. And, and however, the use of prophylaxis could result in higher doses of, um, of uh, phenylephrine uh, consumed. So very quickly, I'll go through a few studies that uh, look at the various regimens which have been used. So this um, first study that uh, I put up here uh, was actually done by Ashraf Habib's group uh, from Duke. Um, when they look at the use of four fixed infusion rates of um, phenylephrine to prevent hypotension, namely 25, 50, 75, and 100 mites per minute. And, and in that study, they found that uh, 25 to 50 mics per minute uh, would be optimal because uh, you would uh, have fewer uh, incidents of reactive hypertension, meaning BP going up to more than 120% of uh, the baseline. And uh, there's also a lower propensity of uh, um, hypotension uh, in comparison with just uh, giving uh, rescue bol boluses. So, so that's quite uh, intuitive. And, and that uh, finding was sort of corroborated by uh, this uh, study that looked at um, a variable rate phenylephrine infusion. Variable meaning in accordance to body weight. So the author started uh, with a 0.75 mics per kilo per minute, roughly worked out to be about 50 mics. Uh, per minute infusion, and then uh, provided rescue boluses in the, in, in the event of hypotension. Uh, you can see this rather involved uh, decision tree uh, for, for this regimen. And they too uh, found that the use of a moderate uh, rate of infusion uh, prophylactically and, and uh, timely rescue boluses could uh, result in a uh, better uh, outcome uh, for the mother as well as the possibility or, or potential of a limiting clinician workload. A third study also supports the use of a continuous infusion, uh, this time a, about 20, 25 mics per minute, and the authors then vary the rescue boluses uh, accordingly, depending on um, the blood pressure and, and the heart rate. And, and that's been found to be beneficial in terms of uh, moderating the risk of uh, hypotension. On the other hand, um, there have been uh, publications that uh, demonstrated the uh, non-inferiority of uh, uh, phenylephrine boluses in comparison with an infusion. Uh, this study, for example, which was published by uh, Jose Cavallas group from uh, Toronto, uh, found that the use of uh, rescue 120 mics, uh, which incidentally is a uh, the ED95, uh, according to that group uh, of phenylephrine, that uh, was able to reverse uh, hypotension very effectively and efficient, more perhaps more efficiently than a continuous infusion of 120 mics uh, per minute. And and uh, they also found that. Uh, uh, when an infusion is used, uh, you might get a much higher consumption of uh, phenylephrine without necessarily uh, giving you more beneficial effects. So what do we do in KKH? Um, currently, um, this is uh, our practice. I must say that this is not practiced across the board by everyone. Everybody has a bit of a variation, um, but largely uh, a majority of uh, uh, anesthetists in KKH practice a bolus regimen. Uh, depending on the blood pressure, if it's less than 100 millimeter mercury, that's that's um, uh, roughly uh, 50 mics will be given. Um, if it's less than uh, 90 mmHg, about 100 mics. So, so the dose that's used is dependent on the severity of blood pressure, uh, uh, sorry, of hypotension. And we check the blood pressure every minute. Um, and, and the other caveat is that we watch the heart rate very carefully. So, so sometimes. Uh, even before the change or, or the next reading of blood pressure comes up, if you see a, uh, an increasing heart rate, tachycardia is often one of the first signs, not necessarily all the time, but uh, uh, commonly so. 
uh, of uh, vasodilatation and, and potential hypotension, uh, we could then opt to uh, start to give uh, phenylephrine. And uh, the next question that arises would be, uh, can phenylephrine be used in some special circumstances? For example, uh, severe preeclampsia, right? Uh, when I was training as well, 30 years ago, we were told never to give spinal anesthesia to somebody who had uh, severe preeclampsia. We now know that that is uh, probably not true because uh, at that time, the belief was that uh, you might then cause a uh, precipitous drop in blood pressure and a reduction in perfusion. Uh, but uh, uh, evidence has shown that um, spinal uh, patients who are suffering from severe preeclampsia are actually more resistant uh, to the effect of uh, hypotension or to the effect of spinal anesthesia. Uh, we talk about hypotension. And, and uh, uh, phenylephrine, um, in our consensus statement, is still the optimal first-line vasopressor. However, um, the doses required uh, may be lower, uh, and, and, uh, and that's been shown in some studies. And therefore, a prophylactic vasopressor infusion, if that's your practice, uh, you may not require that. And you have to watch the blood pressures and, and the hemodynamics very, very carefully. What about... Um, the other vasopressors. In the last few minutes, I, I want to maybe just mention about this. Um, we, we use ephedrine as well. I, and this is a photograph of our closed loop system uh, using the little schema that I showed you earlier about uh, sensor um, controller infector. So, so the sensor would be uh, the blood pressure monitor. This is a neck spin that looks at uh, blood pressure continuously, non-invasively. And the microprocessor now it becomes a controller and the effectors uh, would be phenylephrine as first line and ephedrine as second line. So, so um, schematically, this is how it looks like. So we measure the blood pressure and if the, it drifts down to uh, less than 100%, uh, then depending on the heart rate, uh, we would administer either phenylephrine or ephedrine. And uh, in our studies, uh, we found that uh, up to about 20% of um, patients who have developed hypotension would have a uh, heart rate less than 60 and, and, uh, and that uh, would perhaps warrant the use of uh, ephedrine because we certainly don't want to exacerbate uh, the effect of uh, um, a slow heart rate on, on this group of patients. And apart from that, uh, other agents such as uh, anticholinergic agents, glycopyrrolate, uh, electropin have also been used uh, uh, when uh, blood pressure, low blood pressure uh, is associated with a, uh, a low heart rate. Um, not to belabor the point, uh, just to uh, talk about some of the benefits of closed loop system. And, and uh, of course, uh, we are now looking at the possibility of uh, having a more, um, simple and, and a, a more reliable technique of uh, providing a um, management of, of blood pressure uh, during spinal anesthesia. So, so that's in the works. Um, and norepinephrine is, is the other agent uh, which has gained a lot of popularity. I'm aware that Dr. Frederick Mazier will be giving a talk on that uh, later in the, in the series. Um, so I will not belabor the point. I put a photograph of uh, Warwick Nanki here. I think some of you may recognize him. I have to credit him for a lot of the stuff that I talked about earlier. He's done a lot to, uh, to uh, shift the practice of practice from uh, using a, an agent such as ephedrine to, to phenylephrine. And that's really benefited a lot of our patients. Um, and back to norepinephrine, um, Warwick now uh, advocates the use of uh, norepinephrine. Uh, it's shown in the, quite a few studies, including this one that, sh that clearly demonstrated that uh, uh, norepinephrine is as efficacious, uh, if not more so than phenylephrine uh, without uh, the risk of uh, severe bradycardia because norepinephrine has both uh, alpha predominantly as well as uh, a beta defense. Um, but um, there's still, the use of norepinephrine, of course, is still shrouded in some kind of uh, a controversy because uh, a lot of people are still not, uh, have questions about um, the safety profile, both for the mother as well as for the fetus. But I do expect uh, a lot of discussion in, in this space uh, in the coming years. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I've come to the end of my presentation and I'd like to uh, submit to you that hypotension after spinal anesthesia is very common 
and, and the use of visa presses is often uh, inevitable. Uh, and uh, phenylephrine is the first line visa presser that goes without saying and is used with fluid preloading. Sorry, there's a, um, uh, a typo here. Fluid co-loading uh, would be perhaps the best combination to prevent uh, hypotension. Uh, ephedrine may be considered if hypotension is associated with heart rate. Uh, we found that uh, uh, it is um, beneficial and it, it, it's a very useful second line drug and nothing beats vigilance monitoring of uh, blood pressure. That's, that's, uh, that's absolutely uh, imperative and, and the use of a non-invasive continuous blood pressure uh, monitoring may be helpful, but of course that would, uh, that would involve a, a, a greater capital exposure. And, and the use of a closed loop uh, infusion blood pressure may reduce anesthesia workload. And this is something that uh, we are continuing uh, to work on so that we will be able to individualize care in accordance uh, with the needs of the patients. Uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge our funders, National Medical Research Council, as, as well as my collaborators who have uh, done a lot of work in this area. And uh, leaves me again to thank all of you for your attention. And I wish you all a wonderful afternoon ahead. And um, just to remind everyone that the World Congress will be held in Singapore in 2024. I am very om optimistic by then we will be able to meet face to face with impunity. Yes. With that, thanks so much again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cecilo. Thanks, Alex. It was a wonderful uh, presentation with so many things that we have we can discuss because I, we found 30 years ago our uh, senior teach us about the non-pharmacologic uh, things to prevent the hypotension, but seems now you yeah, like uh, tilt and so on and so forth, but seems it is not work as we hope. And also fluid pre preloading, co-loading, crystalloid, colloid, also seems that it is not uh, work as we hope. But yeah. now- I agree with you, Cecilo. I, I think I, I must, yeah. Um, uh, make this uh, sort of provision or, 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 or caveat that it is, I don't think it's useless. I don't think it's yeah. harmful, uh, but it certainly, uh, you probably will need some vasopressors if we want to, to uh, maintain a, a good blood pressure for all the patients. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, as you mentioned that maybe it is mostly because of uh, sympatholytic effect of the local anesthetic in neuroaxial block. I agree, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alex also mentioned about the yeah, regimen in KKH. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we are lucky we have so many friends in obstetric anesthesia, mm -hmm. like you, Brendan Carvalho, Jose Carvalho, Ruth Landau, Mike Kinsella, Warwick Nganki, Frederick Mercier, and Sophie. So we have so many friends that yeah, we can also gather together to make uh, obstetric anesthesia in the world become better. Thank you. And uh, there are some questions for you. I start with the first question. Prof. Alex, what the target of blood pressure in, for obstetric patient undergoing spinal, especially for those who have lower baseline? Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks very much. A wonderful question. I um, even in KK, I don't think there's a standard uh, a number, right? Um, but I can share with you what I do. I look at the systolic blood pressure, and 100 is my sort of ballpark. Okay. Anything below 100, I would uh, then look at the baseline. Um, and uh, if if it's um, if it's not so much lower than that, I might give a 50 mics of phenylephrine uh, after, of course, having done all the other maneuvers like co-loading and, and all that. And if it's significantly more than maybe less than 90, uh, I would give 100 uh, micrograms of uh, phenylephrine. And I watch the patients carefully. I watch the heart rate carefully and I uh, look at the blood pressure every minute. Um, this is, um, in a sense, a, um, a technique that has been used uh, not perfect, of course, but uh, uh, it's, it's a good way to start. And, and we are also looking at uh, the possibility. We, we Like Cecilo, like what we say, we learn from one another, right? Yeah. So, so we want to look at uh, the role of starting a continuous infusion. Uh, but of course, 
in the context of uh, KK Hospital, I'm sure in many places as well in Indonesia, that would involve another piece of equipment, another, you know, sort of you put another series. So it's a bit more work and um, a bit more uh, activity. And, and we so, should also be mindful about uh, all the other uh, consequences of that, including a uh, possibility of drug error, you know, uh, dilution, uh, uh, we have to be careful about dilutions and, and, and things like that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Yes, yeah, since in Indonesia we are now in a, a happening of enhanced recovery after C-section. So everybody now have uh, things to remind that hypotension is one important element that should be prevent to happen. Yes. The other question is with lower dose of spinal, is prophylactic Vasoconstrictor still in place, especially in Indonesia, I think. Yeah, <laughs> because I, I, I um, if, if you if, if may yeah. indulge me, I, I'll share with you uh, what we learned our journey. Uh, we, we started doing spinal anesthesia in the lateral position. Um, yeah. We started by using 10 milligrams of hyperbaric propipacaine, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and subsequently. Uh, we change our practice doing our spinal anesthesia sitting up. I'm not sure what uh, what is the practice in Indonesia, but uh, we have done that. Mostly, mostly also sitting now. Sitting up, right? Yeah. So, so um, the 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 principle I think um, is that uh, you only have one shot when you do a spinal, right? Yeah. You, you can't. Uh, uh, there's no rescue in in in, yeah. in to some extent. You, you can't uh, extend the block. Um, yeah. So 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 that's that's uh, we parked that aside. But when we started doing a uh, regional anesthesia, I told you 30 years ago, it was about 100% yes. <laughs> GA. So yeah. we did it very cautiously, right? So, yeah. so we, we actually started ironically with a CSE because oh. we, we wanted to, to make sure that the blocks work and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. By using CSE, I think uh, uh, there is a, uh, we've, we've done some work in that area. So, so, so there is a, a, a possibility and opportunity for us to moderate the doses. Um, and I've seen practice in the, in the, the UK as well, where they use quite low doses, in my opinion, uh, um, 7.5 milligrams. But they use a technique called an epidural volume extension, right? Mm. Uh, after injection of spinal, they put yeah. normal saline into the epidural. The epidural. So you see okay. the block coming up, right? Yeah. So um, I... I I don't know the actual answer uh, to that question, but I would strongly recommend that um, we use um, nothing less than 10 milligrams uh, because uh, in our study, we found that even with 10 milligrams um, with morphine, uh, there were cases of failure and, and we really don't want uh, the block to fail, right? Uh, and that, that would be very disappointing both for the patient as well as for, for ourselves. So um, this... If you look at the literature, I think people are talking about 11.5 milligrams. Yeah. And actually, that's what we do. Uh, uh, 2.3 mils of 0.5% hyperbaric would be And I believe, Cecilio, that's what you do as well, right? I mean, the, the same uh, I have concentration, right? 0.5% yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. heavy yeah. Yeah. And we add fentanyl and morphine yeah. uh, in that concoction. And... and, um, and uh, if there's hypotension, especially now that you're going to get phenylephrine, yeah. uh, there's a way out of it. Right? Yeah, yeah. But if the block doesn't work, then uh, you will be in trouble. You need to think about how how to, you know, ex uh, you know how to make it work. And and the worst case scenario, you might have to convert that to general anesthesia. That's what we try to avoid. Right. So, quick answer to that question is yeah. I would use about uh, two to two point three mils of uh, marcaine. With fentanyl and, and morphine, I know that uh, in Indonesia, I've, I've read papers where uh, much lower doses are used. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but um, uh, again, I can't comment on on, on those because um, it might be related to the technique that you do and or, or the positioning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. You're right. The positioning of yeah. my patient usually Trendelenburg, so it is like fifteen to twenty degree. Then the blood pressure is not going down, but. Yeah, so many colleagues that not uh, satisfied with the dose. So now, as you mentioned, that we have phenylephrine is the way out of that problem. It can use the regular dose he usually or she usually use, then combine with phenylephrine to make sure that blood pressure in the one important element of enhanced recovery after C-section yes. 
is uh, maintained. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because, because um, a low intraoperative nausea and vomiting. For yeah, it's very quite a bit of a headache for for yeah. some of us, right? Yeah. So, so, and obviously, you would have repercussions on your your Iraq uh, subsequently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is important to make sure that no hypotension, no intraoperative nausea and vomiting. And the third, the third question, or the it will be from Diki Tampu Bolon. Can we use ephedrine prophylaxis like phenylephrine? If, if we can, how? How much maybe? Because in Indonesia, we only have if ephedrine now. Um, okay, so so if we map back um, the dose, the potency ratio of phenylephrine versus ephedrine is about one to AC, I think. So so we're talking about the region of maybe five to 10 milligrams of uh, ephedrine, if we want to do that. Now. But the question um, then is uh, whether we want to do that. Uh, I um, feel uh, ephedrine is a, is a good drug. It's not as potent, uh, but it does have quite a bit of uh, side effects as well, right? It causes yeah, yeah. a bit of tachycardia and, and it's, it's um, onset is a bit uh, longer. Of course, its duration could be a bit longer as well. And if I'm not wrong, uh, I've, I used to write on this, uh, is that uh, I'm not sure whether the evidence is still uh, uh, current, is ephedrine may be associated with nausea and vomiting, um, which is a bit of a, a paradox uh, in the, the obstetric patient. So uh, given the choice, especially now you have phenylephrine, which is available, I, I would uh, perhaps suggest not to use uh, ephedrine as a prophylaxis. But if you have nothing else, then I guess it's okay. it is better than nothing, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I found a study that it is conflicting. Yes. Some patient, if you give prophylactic, become hypertension directly. Yeah. So I think it's not quite right. if you do it like a prophylaxis for sure. uh, hypertension with ephedrine. Yeah. But so many study about the use of phenylephrine for prophylaxis is very good. Yeah. The other question is, what about pregnant mothers who have to undergo GA, not for C-section? Do we have to administer prophylactic vasopressor? I think, okay. It's up to you. Like, in in, in gen, general, for general anesthesia? Yeah, for GA, yeah. Yeah, um, not my practice. I, I, I think um, uh, somehow spinal anesthesia is, uh, is a bigger culprit. Right. So, yeah. so we have to be more mindful. I think we could be a little bit more conservative when it comes to general anesthesia. It doesn't mean that they will not become hypotensive, but uh, I, I um, personally will not administer uh, phenylephrine prophylactically. Yeah. Uh, just, just a point about uh, phenylephrine. That my experience, um, the preparation of phenylephrine is quite important. Uh, it often comes in very high concentrations. Uh, mm. 10 oh, different different concentration. Yes, so okay. so we have to be very mindful uh, in terms of um, uh, dilution. Uh, we, we used to have a, if I'm not wrong, five mils of uh, um, uh, phenylephrine, uh, ten milligrams per mil. So so our practice was to take a, you know, a a, a, a pint of uh, normal saline. Mm -hmm. We take out five mils and then we put in five mils and that would be 100 mics per mil. Oh. And you can share among oh. everybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> for that day. Theater, <laughs> right? But if it is yeah. one, one, mil, one mil, one uh, cc, then uh, you have to maybe, mm. I don't know whether you can get 100 cc uh, back and then you could then dilute that. So, so um, just, just uh, a point to note. Yeah, I thought because, this only... uh, our experience is we have had <laughs> dilution errors and and uh, and ca causing derangements in the in in the you know the hemodynamics of our patients. No, I, I <laughs> just uh, surprised that I thought only in Indonesia you you do it once and then you can share for other yes. operating theatre. Yeah. <laughs> it's happened so, also in KK. <laughs> so uh, what has transpired is that uh, lately we've managed to get a pre-diluted one. But it took us a few years to, to get mm. there. That would be, like what you said, Cecilio, maybe a well safer as well as easier for our, for our yeah. staff, right? So you just uh, break the vial and then I think it's 10 mils, 100 mics per mil kind of concentration. But uh, it's a, a recent uh, uh, development, yeah. Yeah. The other question is, he, he want to know what is your colloding uh, fluid that you give oh, okay. in practice, in your practice? 
in, in my practice, I use uh, crystalloids because we don't routinely use colloids, even though we have published a bit of work on, on colloids. Uh, and um, uh, interestingly, after spinal anesthesia in our studies, when we look at cardiac output and all that, the cardiac output would usually go up because of vasodilatation, okay. but the blood, blood pressure will come down, yeah, you yeah. know. Uh, and and uh, having colloid um, given uh, as a colloid, uh, that's been found to be... Um, as effective, if not even more than crystalloids. Uh, but for crystalloids, you will need to give more. So I would use maybe one liter, uh, definitely more than uh, 500 mils, right? And and run it as fast as you can. Again, if you want to look at co loading, there are quite a lot of definitions. Some yeah. people put on the arterial uh, IA line pump and pump in the fluid quickly. Some people just put it as high as you can and just uh, have it on free flow. Um, but the, the, the essence or, or, or the spirit is try to get as much fluid as possible into this patient while spinal um, is the spinal anesthesia part of it is kicking in, not afterwards. After you have injected, you, you could uh, start doing that completely. Uh, short answer to the question, uh, it also depends on the size of the patient, maybe about a litre. Okay. Yeah. But no, not colloiding. Oh, oh colloiding. Uh, co colloiding. Yeah. Colloiding. Uh, we, we don't use colloid. Uh, uh, colloid for colloiding. Uh, routinely yep. right uh, but that that's been used as well and uh, yeah but you may need a, a bit less uh, so if you're using colloid it would be um, intuitively at least uh, more efficient uh, maybe 500 mils uh, mm. as opposed to 1 to 1.5 liters right? yeah 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 maybe in the era of enhanced recovery after c-section we can yeah. reduce the colloiding eh? because the yeah. patient is already have a 400 cc drink two hours before surgery. That's right. The the other question will be for OB patient with chronic hypertension. Any specific recommendation for vasopressor and target of blood pressure? Yeah. So a uh, good, very good question. Eh? But uh, I I don't think that uh, based on what we know, there's no special considerations. I don't think you should stop using phenylephrine, but you may have to use that a little bit more uh, uh, more cautiously. You may not want to give high infusion prophylactically yeah. because uh, that was actually uh, what uh, Warwick Nanki originally uh, uh, proposed, uh, 100 mics per mil. You know, that's, that's quite a high dose. Um, you may want to modulate that a little bit. I, I might not even give um, a, a, a prophylaxis. I'll just watch the BP carefully. Uh, I don't think it's contraindicated. Uh, again, hypertension, I think, um, is, is quite a, it's not a homogeneous group, right? There, there, there are many, many, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a whole spectrum, right? Uh, and, and we just need to be careful in, um, even in, in patients with spinal, uh, sorry, with severe preeclampsia, uh, there are some who have uh, quite compromised cardiac function. So, so in those cases, my suggestion maybe is to, not give spinal anesthesia, perhaps a CSE and slowly build up the block and then use uh, phenylephrine judi judiciously. So, so, um, so the question is whether would you use spinal anesthesia the way that we do it here, a single shot, mm. uh, a high-ish dose, right? You want a dose which is perhaps higher than what most people require and because that, that's the aim of spinal anesthesia, right? Thanks. Oh, thank you. Yeah. The the question the next question is from my colleague. We are graduated together as an anesthesiologist thirty four years ago. As Rifki, it's my colleague from Padang now. Okay. As you, hey, Alex, how about if we give phenylephrine through IV line at the at the arm? As we know, will be vasoconstricted effect in vasodilated area. And to make vasoconstricted in not vasodilated area, what your opinion about that can give as a problem? How about if give vasopressor on the leg that can give different effect? Can you catch the question? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I, um, I think I, I got it. Uh, so, so the question is whether does it make a difference if you give phenylephrine through the arm or somewhere else, the leg, right? Yeah, or the, um, on the leg. Uh, my, 
I haven't done any study in that respect, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I don't think there will be a big difference. This is my opinion, uh, because uh, the, the drug would then will have to uh, go back uh, and get recirculated and, and uh, they, they almost always end up in the, the same place, right? Unless you're talking about uh, the um, infusion leaking out. Possible, uh, if you give it into the leg and there's, for whatever reason, there's uh, bleeding or there's um, a venous stasis and all that, that, that could affect, I guess, the, uh, the uh, efficacy or, or the, um, the concentration of uh, phenylephrine reaching um, the central compartment. Um, but uh, I, would, I would believe that that's more like an exception than a rule. So, so um, if the patient is hypotensive uh, and already showing symptoms of uh, nausea and vomiting, I think that we just, you can find a vein, I think we can just uh, yeah, get phenylephrine uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. I hope my colleague in Padang kept the message, eh? <laughs> as Rifki. There is also an anonymous attendee asked for you, tahiphylaxis after a few repeated doses of ephedrine. Is it real or just an ignorable worry? Um, so, so just from, um, there's been quite a lot written on it. Uh, by my personal experience, it's, it is real. And, and uh, I'm not sure whether... Uh, you, oh, you know, the audience agree, but uh, after a while, it doesn't seem to be so um, responsive. The patient is not so responsive anymore, especially those with uh, severe hypotension. Uh, as far as phenylephrine is concerned, um, I, I have not seen uh, that effect uh, so significantly. Um, so, so, so I think phenylephrine is probably more reliable uh, as far as that's concerned. And, and for ephedrine personally, it, well, it could also be due to the fact that uh, it's um, it's uh, it's long acting. It's a little bit not so predictable, right? And it's not so potent. So ephedrine, uh, it, it might not uh, be as quick as you you want it to work, and and that I think compound our sort of impression that uh, it's it's perhaps uh, not uh, working so fast or so quickly. Hence, tachyphylaxis. Yeah. This is uh, the last question. Actually, I want to ask this also. Uterine placenta impairment, which one is better between ephedrine or phenylephrine? Is the debate over or still going on? Because I want to ask about the difference in pH of the baby. Yeah. I think you do the study of this with Warwick. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I, this is a very good question. Um, I, I don't have a direct answer to this, but uh, I, I know why some Maybe you, Cecilo, ask these questions because uh, uh, there have been quite a few studies that show that um, animal studies, right? They um, instrumented uh, uh, the ewes and and um, kambing, right? And then uh, they they would run phenylephrine, and and they showed that uh, uh, there could perhaps uh, be some repercussions of uh, uh, the effect of phenylephrine on the uteroplacental circulation, especially in the chronically. Uh, compromised uh, circulation, right? Um, so, so that's a word of caution. Uh, I, I think the author who published this, um, his name was Ikinora, I think, uh, quite a few years ago. So, so that made us a little bit uh, uh, concerned, obviously, right? But clinically, uh, I don't think there's been a uh, any study um, that uh, clearly demonstrated the, the adverse effect of uh, ephedrine versus. Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, phenylephrine versus ephedrine. If at all, it's the reverse, right? Um, so, so, so that's point number one. And two is, uh, and that's one. Uh, um, Warwick Yankee, of course, is is uh, uh, truly a pioneer in this area. But mm -hmm. one of the uh, comments that came out from uh, the, you know uh, the work that he published is that uh, uh, w do we need to be cautious uh, using such high doses? In patients with compromised uteroplacental placental circulation, I don't think there's a, a clear and direct answer to that. Uh, what we've got, uh, in a sense, are pieces of evidence that suggest that it's perhaps not as harmful as we thought uh, it would be. So, so then you back the question that what would be uh, a drug that you want to use in order to uh, to bring the blood pressure up? So, so on the uh, on the other hand, we also need to ensure that. Uh, uh, as a whole system, uh, we, we, we don't want the patient as well as the fetus to under to, to suffer from hypotension. Mm -hmm. Right. So so that there's that balance that we need to strike. 
I think uh, I've never used norepinephrine, but I think there is some suggestion that uh, it might be useful initially. But uh, there was at least one publication that uh, that showed that uh, norepinephrine uh, may not be as good as uh, phenylephrine uh, in terms of acid base uh, balance for the fetus. But again, there are a lot of criticism of that study, and and I kind of like showed an editorial. Uh, following that study written by Michael Heason, right? So very long answer to a yeah. very short uh, question. <laughs> right. uh, so so we just have to be cautious and and uh, uh, whatever that works, use the drugs judiciously, monitor carefully, bring the BP up nicely, uh, because um, one of the risks of uh, you know, if I didn't overemphasize this earlier, is reactive hypertension. If not used carefully, you might have uh, very quite high BP yeah. and bradycardia. So, so in my opinion, if you have a compromised uterine placental circulation, in that kind of setting, then there might be some uh, non, uh, you know, non-desirable effects, right? That, but, but again, I think uh, we, we, we need more data to, to, to prove that, yeah. It's interesting. I think, yeah. I found that in, in panelists, we have Chan Yu Quen. Can we ask her to give a comment or question for you? Chen Yu Quen? Well, it's not active. She's not active. Okay, if nobody else uh, make a question. Oh, there is one more, new one. Sorry, I okay. heard my name being called. Okay, you I, oh, may I join now. Sorry, what was your question? I didn't get it because I was away for a short while. It's not a question. Do you want to have a comment or question for Alex? All right. All right. Of course, Alexia did a very comprehensive question. Uh, sorry, a presentation. I don't think there's any room for doubts and uh, <laughs> questions even in my mind. Perfect. Time, Perfect right? presentation. I gave him 101% marks. Oh. Would that be a compliment? <laughs> And because he did such a good presentation, yeah. I'm inviting him to be an opinion leader in our group console. I hope he accepts it. Oh, yeah. The invitation was just sent a short while ago. So uh, now that it's in the public domain, he has got no room for denying. I'll, I'll and be honest declining. To, be honest. All right, good. I'm going to put him already. See how I blackmail people. Yeah, console is a very... I'll try my best about, yeah. <laughs> No, because this is Malaysian style, you know, Susilo. <laughs> you blackmail people in public. <laughs> in public area. Eh? <laughs> and and uh, on you... that note, what, what is a console again? I, I agree without finding out what, what it is. It's not spelled C-O-N-S-O-L-E, <laughs> but context sensitive obstetric anesthesia leadership. Because, you know, in, in, in your... Um, in your uh, presentation, you were talking about a lot of situations where, you know, this is, I mean, phenol is very good and ephedrine, not too bad sometimes, you know, can be used and all that, right? So, um, we are actually going, because Robert Dyer, who is the leader in the obstetric group at the present moment in the WFSA, is very, uh, shall we say, um, mindful, wants us to be mindful of the situation we are in whenever we actually talk about and, and have a stand for anything. So um, the next question that's going to come out in this console discussion would be whether uh, no adrenaline is a good substitute for as a vasopressor. Since you brought it up, we thought, well, we better get him in before the question is released on all of us. Yeah. So we need a person like you to be there too. <laughs> if I were to crystal ball it, I think it will continue to enjoy even more mind share. You're talking no, about adrenaline? More adrenaline. no adrenaline. No yeah. adrenaline. All right. I, yeah, but I um, there's still, as I said earlier, there's still you know there's some controversy. People are not so comfortable, especially using no e. Um, peripherally, for example, mm. right? And, and the previous yeah, studies that's, that showed that's that... Some uh, of, yeah, that's yeah. some of the issues that Robert actually brought up as well. Yeah. So um, he's actually published something on it as well. That's, and that's right. he would like all of us to be... Uh, because he almost condemns it. But never mind, I yeah. shall 
leave the excitement till later. Yeah, and, so I, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, Frederick Messier's talk. I think he's going to be doing no epinephrine. Oh, good, good, good. So yeah. I From shall... From what uh, sent me, I think that will be next week. I think he will yeah. be doing it. Yeah, yeah. okay. I shall so, also join that. He has that published quite a bit of work on that as well. Yeah, yeah. okay, good. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Thank yeah, you. sorry. I always get so chatty and can't <laughs> come off. Okay, no problem. All right. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Yes. <laughs> so the last question for you, Alex. I will not uh, mention the question for geriatric patient because it's not related to this the topic today. The last question is in patient with massive obstetric hemorrhage, which one do you prefer, phenylephrine or ephedrine? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> So that's, the, that's a bit of a loaded question in my opinion, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, because the treatment for massive uh, bleeding is probably not first-line vasopressor, so, so we need to look at how we could restore volume. And, uh, and, but again, I think uh, uh, in the presence of spinal, you know, uh, spinal anesthesia, where uh, uh, hypotension is further compounded by, uh, by spinal anesthesia, then I would uh, still go for phenylephrine because um, like what I mentioned earlier, it is uh, most physiologically um, appropriate, right? Uh, yeah. The effect of spinal anesthesia is vasodilatation and you want something that would cause vasoconstriction rather than ephedrine, for example, that's got a very significant beta effect, right? So, so I would still go for phenylephrine, but the caveat I think is uh, in the presence of massive hemorrhage, uh, um, we, the first, Target is still yeah. still to restore volume, right? Yeah, yeah. sure, agree. Thanks. Yeah, we should think about the massive transfusion protocol and so on yes, instead yes, of yeah. yeah. And uh, my last question is for you personally. You have a patent of some important uh, amalmentarium. What do you suggest for us in Indonesia? the use of your uh, equipment, your inventing, uh, with, uh, combined with uh, phenylephrine. Yeah. So, so uh, great, great point, Silo. Uh, uh, so we did some work in, um, I, I, I presume you're referring to the closed loop. Yeah, yeah. Closed loop uh, control of uh, blood yeah. pressure. Um, and, and it works uh, very well. However, um, it, uh, there, there are a few... Uh, uh, situations that we need to contend with. First is the, the cost of uh, the system, the right? The, the non-invasive continuous blood pressure. We, we love it, but uh, it's it's quite standalone and, and it's, it's not uh, inexpensive. So, so, so that may be a deterrent. Um, second is the, um, the protocol. And, and while, while I mentioned that uh, we, we, about 20% of the patients might need ephedrine, on top of phenylephrine, we, we think that uh, having two may still be a little bit cumbersome. So, so we are looking at the possibility of, uh, uh, you know, maybe just having phenylephrine as the main one. And uh, and perhaps uh, uh, we look at uh, certain triggers for, for, for the anesthetist to come in to, to help the system. So, so um, long and short is we are looking at the possibility. Of course, this is, this is not, uh, hasn't happened yet, but uh, that's our aim to have a, a system, embedded system, that's able to give both fixed and variable mm. um, in one uh, syringe pump, which hopefully will be inexpensive and then uh, will assist the anesthetist. It doesn't take over the role of anesthetist, but to, to assist the anesthetist help, and yeah. ensure that uh, uh, patients are kept relatively stable. Um, because the, the earlier closed-loop system, uh, we, well... We, we, we didn't over-engineer it. We engineered it in such a way that uh, it takes the load off the anesthetist. And, and, and uh, truth to be told, I think we are quite successful in doing that. But uh, uh, again, coming back uh, on the balance, whether we absolutely need a system like that, that uh, totally takes the anesthetist out of the equation, or we could have a, a man-machine sort of uh, collaboration. Um, then, and that might be a more uh, suitable way forward uh, as also as well as uh, financially more sustainable uh, moving ahead yeah sometimes we have a problem with that if the the equipment is expensive then the hospital say no 
since you are the CEO of this hospital, you can yeah. balance maybe the benefit of the equipment right. and yeah. yeah. So, so we do have a system and, and, uh, and uh, when we started, of course, it was uh, through research funding and, and all that. And we never passed the cost to the patient. Um, but it, uh, at, at a particular stage, we will need to think about how to implement mm. and, uh, and uh, sort of mainstream that service. So, so that's where your cost effectiveness, the economics will have to come to play. And, um, and, and uh, the long and short is I think we want uh, as many people to benefit from it as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and cost is, a, uh, is a quite a major consideration. So, so, so we're looking at how uh, we could strike, a, a, I guess, a, a better balance in that respect. Yeah. yeah. If it is uh, in the role of ayam and telur, Yes. Which one is the first? So if you make it more uh, spreading, then maybe yes. the cost will be... Exactly. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it has to be a system which is um, manageable. Uh, it can't be so big um, and, and so sophisticated that uh, uh, the barrier of entry is then uh, unnecessarily high. So, so that may then also deter uh, its adoption. So, sure. so there are quite a lot of... Uh, points that we have to take into consideration in this respect. But we believe that uh, having a sort of a, uh, we don't call it a closed loop, an interactive system. Interactive. I think that's quite important um, because every patient kind of behaves a bit differently. So, mm -hmm. so we want to be able to react as well as proact in a real-time manner <laughs> Yeah, to, to ensure the best outcomes. Yeah. yeah, we have Eddie and Krisha here. I think they will agree that someday we should do a webinar on that, on that, we discuss more deep so we can uh, ensure that everybody know the importance of this equipment. Yeah, maybe if, if this is uh, uh, knowledgeable and everybody understand, then maybe somebody can yeah, help us in Indonesia to spread your product. Krisha, then Adi. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Looking I think yeah, there's a wrap up our discussion today. Thank you, Alex, for everything. You're most welcome. Thank you so much for your invitation. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for for the Sverdin Skabi Indonesia to sponsor this program. And Krisha, back to you. Again, Prof. Alex, always great to see you. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, you so hopefully next year uh, when oh, everything yes. yeah getting better. And again, 2024 for good luck for oh, yeah. World Congress. We have to promote, Chris. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. For sure. For sure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> If possible, then we will be there, yeah? Sure. Yeah. Sure. You have to. <laughs> be there. All right, then. Nice thank you. all of you again. Thank you so much. So yes, yes. It was Adi, lovely to see you. Bang. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Alex. Thank you so much again. Okay. You're welcome. And thank you, Fresen News, for sponsoring uh, this session. Uh, so we will have proceed to the next session. It will be an uh, interesting one. It will, we will, we're going to discuss about critical care medicine. Okay? See you in a few minutes. Yang bicara adalah Zhang, Luis Mangsa, Gatinoni. Jangan lupa. <laughs> <laughs>